Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, today's topic is timing is everything. And now without further ado, let me throw it over to our speaker today. Our speaker is um, uh, Donald McKetron, uh, PhD, teaching professor, coordinator of academic assessment and quality improvement in the School of Biomedical Engineering and Science and Health Systems. Please welcome Dr. McKetron. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see if I can get this started appropriately. So the title of this presentation is Timing is Everything. We're gonna be talking a little bit about biological rhythms and health. Uh, this gentleman is Kronos, the Greek god of time, and the source of the term chronobiology, which is uh, technically what I study, the field of chronobiology. And my name is Don McEachran. I'm a teaching professor at the School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems here at Drexel. All right, so I'm gonna make a claim, uh, which I hope to be able to at least partially establish during this presentation. Um, it takes me literally two quarters to do it um, at the, the School of Biomed where I teach a, a two quarter sequence in the subject. So you have to bear with me if I don't totally convince you in the next 60 minutes, but I'm gonna give it a try. The claim is that biological rhythms are a critical and essential component of all living systems, including humans. In fact, I would go a little farther than that. I would claim that if a person does not understand and appreciate biological rhythms, they really do not understand how living systems operate. So how am I gonna try and convince you? All right, so there's gotta be evidence. So what kind of evidence am I going to present? One would be a demonstration that living systems display significant rhythmicity. For that, I only really need to make observations. I need to be able to show you that rhythms exist at multiple levels throughout biological organisms and biological systems. Then I have to show you data indicating the impact of environmental factors varying with time of exposure. In other words, how an organism reacts to any variable will be different depending on when that variable is applied to the organism or to the biological system. Um, that requires not just observational data, but also experimental studies. And finally, I need to provide evidence that disrupting biological rhythms generates deleterious effects. In other words, it's not enough to say there are biological rhythms and that, um, say, time of day or time, you know, when in a given hour or a month or a year, um, an environmental factor. Um, has an effect, you also have to provide evidence that rhythms are part of the normal function of the biological organism or system. And again, this is both observational and experimental studies. All right, so the first step in any uh, conversation, I would think, is to define your terms. So what is a biological rhythm? Uh, and there's a fairly straightforward definition. It's the reoccurrence of an event within a biological system at more or less regular intervals, all right? And there are a number of different examples. The one I'm sure everyone's familiar with um, is the, the electrocardiogram, uh, the cardiac cycle. So here we have uh, an example of that cycle, but there are other rhythms here you can see um, reported changes in mood, weight gain, uh, and sleeping demonstrated by human beings suffering from a condition called seasonal affective disorder. It is a seasonal depression, or at least the winter version, is a seasonal depression that occur, begins in the fall with the degreasing photo period and then spontaneously remits in the spring. And you can see how powerful that seasonal rhythm is in looking at these various characteristics as they vary across months and seasons. And here you see a um, prolactin rhythm, a endocrine chemical signal, 
And you can see that there is prominent rhythmicity in the these uh, secretion of prolactin. There are basically two kinds of rhythms that you can see here. One indicated by the red dotted line is a daily rhythm. That is in fact a significant daily rhythm. Uh, we know this by doing a least squares cosine fit, but also there are pulsatile um, secretion events. That is, there is what we call an ultradian rhythm that occurs somewhere along the hour to 90 minute range. And as it turns out, all endocrine factors have both pulsatile, i.e. ultradian secretion rhythms, as well as daily secretion rhythms, and many of them show seasonal changes as well. All right, so there are, you know, here's the second step, a demonstration that living systems display significant rhythmicity. And observations indicate a multiplicity of biological rhythms. And we can divide them in lots of different ways. You can divide them based on amplitude. You can divide them based on the biological system showing the rhythm. You can um, characterize them on whether they are rhythms that are imposed by environmental cycles or generated by the system itself. Um, but one way of characterizing these various rhythms is on the basis of frequency. And the frequency range shows just how many rhythms there are within um, biological systems. We can go down uh, to rhythms with a frequency of hertz, or in fact, hundreds of hertz, and hertz is a cycle per second, uh, millisecond rhythms in neuron activity. And these, some of these rhythms have been shown to be inherent to the neuron. That is, cells have been taken out of living organisms maintained in tissue culture, and these neural rhythms persist in tissue culture without the rest of the brain for as long as a week. Then, of course, there is the heart rate. We all know that if the heart is taken out of the body, wouldn't recommend it, uh, but if the heart is taken out of the body, the heart will continue to beat uh, with a frequency uh, of about one full cycle every eight tenths of a second. So heart rate is in fact endogenous. It is generated by the heart itself. Then there are cycles in glycolysis or glycolytic cycles that run for somewhere on the order of 10 to 20 minutes. This is literally a biochemical uh, cycle um, that is rhythmic as, it, how do I put this, it, without any uh, physiological controls generating the rhythm. The biochemical rhythm itself uh, is, is inherent to the, the um, process. Then, as I pointed out, there are hormone secretion rhythms that tend to run on hours. Uh, there's the 90 to 120 minute uh, rapid eye movement, non-rapid eye movement cycle that happens during sleep. You go through various stages uh, of um, con well, not consciousness, but various brain states as you go through sleep. And, and these oscillate with a 90 to 120 minute cycle. Then there's 24 hour rhythms. Um, I said sleep wake cycles, but in fact, there are 24 hour rhythms in virtually every physiological and behavioral characteristic um, and parameter in your body. Um, here you have things that are a bit longer, four to five day sexual cycles or estrous cycles in rats, mice, and hamsters, the 28 day reproductive cycle or menstrual cycle in human beings. Then there are yearly cycles in human suicides and in human birth. And then you can even go to ecological systems where you can see 10 to 11 year population cycles, the famous lynx hair population cycle. All right, the 24 hour daily rhythms, if they are being generated by the system itself, are called circadian. So if I were to take almost any eukaryotic organism, a human being, for example, and put them under constant environmental conditions, their rhythms would not cease. 
They would continue in the absence of any environmental cycle, no change in humidity, no change in light, dark, no change in temperature. But because there are biological clocks within the human body, the circadian rhythms, these near 24 hour cycles would persist cycle after cycle after cycle. And for human beings, the inherent frequency of our circadian clock is about 24 and a half hours. All right, so here are some other examples. Here is the burst and spike activity of a single neuron. Here you can see glycolytic cycles in yeast. Here you see gonadotropin releasing hormone in a female sheep, a ewe. One of the interesting things about this uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is a hormone produced in the hypothalamus and released into the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates two other hormones, follicle stimulating hormone um, and luteinizing hormone. And these hormones interact with uh, the ovaries and testes. And in females, they interact with the ovaries to produce the reproductive cycle. What's interesting here is you can see these pulsatile releases of gonadotropin releasing hormone. If these pulses are inhibited, in other words, suppose you break the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Well, the, the animal will no longer have a sexual cycle. Now, suppose you replace gonadotropin releasing hormone at the right level, but at a constant infusion, not rhythmic, but a constant level of the appropriate concentration. Will you get the cycle back? And the answer is no. You have to pulse the um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. For example, in female rhesus, you have to give it six minutes out of every 60. If you pulse the gonadotropin releasing hormone, then you will get the human, uh, not human, the, the female reproductive cycle back. What's interesting is if you constantly infuse gonadotropin releasing hormone in an intact female, you will turn the sexual cycle off. So this is a hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, when released in a rhythm, gener helps generate a female reproductive cycle. But if infused at a constant level acts as a contraceptive. This to me demonstrates just how important rhythms are. It's not just the, the chemical uh, that has the impact, it's how the chemical is released. What is the frequency? What is the pattern, the rhythm uh, of that chemical? And here, as I mentioned before, you can see the human sleep pattern where you are going through the various stages of sleep. You start at stage one, then drop to stage two, then three, then four. Three and four are collectively called slow wave sleep, sometimes called N3. Then you come back up, you go up through the stages and then you have a episode of REM, you go back down, you go back up, you go back down. This rhythm occurs at about 90 to 120 minutes. Here you can see another rhythm. This is a 24 hour rhythm. Uh, and you can see the effect of aging in human beings. The two top cycles are young men and young women showing daily melatonin secretion. Um, and the bottom two lower amplitude cycles are older men and older women. Uh, and again, it is pineal melatonin secretion. Now, melatonin helps to um, maintain circadian rhythms. And it also, in human beings, acts as a mild sedative, as a sleep enhancer. It also impacts the immune system. So this reduction in the amplitude can have significant impact on sleep, rhythms, and immune function. Here you can see something really fascinating. These are circannual reproductive cycles in two species of birds, a, a species of stone chats, the European and Siberian. And what's interesting about this is they maintain these birds under a constant 
light dark cycle of 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark, maintain them in a laboratory with no seasonal changes in daylight, no seasonal changes in humidity, no seasonal changes in temperature. And yet they continue to go through annual cycles in terms, in this case, what they're measuring is testes size. So annual reproductive cycles being generated inside by the organism. And here you can see the multi-year lynx hair population variations. You can see again, a ecological rhythm running at about 11 years. And of course, these are the two players in that particular uh, rhythm. All right, so, you know, so what? Well, I posted some um, videos to this, one on the interactive metrodome, one on music and Parkinson's and one on gamma oscillations and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease is a tragedy for tens of millions of people and families worldwide. So far, there are no useful treatment options, but what if there was a way to galvanize a response within the brain to fight back against Alzheimer's disease? In her research at MIT's Pickhour Institute for Learning and Memory and Aging Brain Initiative, Professor Li Wei Tsai has learned that brain activity synchronized at the gamma frequency of 40 pulses a second or hertz appears crucial for maintaining the brain's defenses against Alzheimer's disease pathology. In two new studies in cell and neuron, by exposing mice to sound and light at this crucial 40 hertz frequency, Tsai lab scientists led by graduate student Anthony Martorell and Pickhauer fellow Chinika Rupana Dakin enhanced the power of gamma rhythms in the brain. This produced marked reductions in the tau and amyloid beta protein buildups that are key pathological features of Alzheimer's. This sensory stimulation significantly improved the memory of mice engineered to have Alzheimer's disease compared to unstimulated controls. These new studies replicate the results that Tsai and colleagues first published using light stimulation in 2016 and take them much further. In fact, when they exposed mice to several weeks of 40 hertz light, or just a week of light and sound together, they saw some especially profound benefits, reducing amyloid beta protein throughout the cortex. MIT calls this non-invasive potential therapy, Genus, for gamma entrainment using sensory stimuli. Work has begun to see if it will help in humans, but the new data show the effects to be widespread across several different mouse models of the disease. One of the main ways that genus appears to work is by stimulating key helper cells in the brain to respond to the Alzheimer's pathology. After genus treatment, immune cells called microglia change their shape and increase their absorption of amyloid beta protein. They change their gene expression to become less inflammatory. With genus light and sound together, the scientists could see more microglia literally surrounding plaques in the brain than in unstimulated control mice. Meanwhile, genus sound motivated a complex sequence in which they hypothesized that possibly astrocytes and other cells helped to open up blood vessels and link amyloid with another protein that brought the amyloid to the vessels. Importantly, the benefits were evident in many different parts of the brain. In the new studies with longer term light or with sound, it also propagated to the hippocampus, a key region for learning and memory. With longer-term light or with light and sound together, the beneficial effects also occurred in the prefrontal cortex, where we do our highest level of reasoning. Longer-term light, an hour a day for three to six weeks instead of for just one week, reduced the rate of neuron loss and slowed the expansion of ventricles or open spaces in the brain. It also significantly changed gene expression of neurons and microglia, possibly explaining why they changed their response to the disease. A crucial question for any proposed Alzheimer's treatment is, does it improve memory? In these new studies, genus did appear to improve mouse memory in multiple standard tests, including recognizing whether objects were new or familiar, whether they were in a new or prior location, and how to escape an environment. Now, mice are not people. Even if they do closely model the pathology and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, so work is ongoing at MIT to test genus for human use. Meanwhile, lab research continues. 
The lab's goal is to help people by developing a device or system that will use the senses to empower their brain cells to fight back against Alzheimer's disease. Okay, I hope that that impressed you the way it did me when I first learned of this research. It's a matter of rhythms, the proper oscillation. And what's fantastic about this is that it is entirely non-invasive. So anybody have any questions about this while well, I have a chance to sort of Reset my I have a question. Uh, where is the this, this study now? Have they moved on to work? Yeah, they're in the, the they're in clinical trials, as I understand it. Oh, it's very exciting. Now, if we have time, uh, depending on how much I talk, um, and I forgive me, I, I do tend to talk a lot. We'll come back and take a look at two other ways that rhythms are being used. One in the, the treatment of ADHD-like syndromes and the use of mu music uh, in Parkinson's disorder. Again, to show the, the astonishing power that rhythms have. All right, now we're gonna focus a little bit, for the rest of this talk, we're gonna focus on uh, a different frequency, the daily frequency in circadian rhythms. But you notice that genus is uh, talking about entrainment, gamma entrainment by sensory stimulation. And this is a common process. Um, when you're talking about the circadian pacemaker, which is found in an area of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that clock has its own inherent frequency. And left to its own devices, if there was no light-dark cycle, it would run at about 24 and a half hours. That pacemaker, in turn, synchronizes a whole set of other oscillators within the body. And so when there is a powerful light-dark cycle, it synchronizes or entrains the, this circadian pacemaker and the circadian pacemaker entrains the other oscillators, and you have a um, coherent rhythmic system. Now, the only way I can kind of explain this, I think in a, in a way that makes sense to most people, is to think about the last time you went to a, a, a symphony or an orchestra concert. And if you got there a little bit early, um, the, the instruments are playing snatches of music, they're warming up, they're tuning their instruments. And even though occasionally you might hear a tune that you recognize, generally all of this activity is generating noise, all right? It's not what you, you bought your tickets to hear. And eventually an individual walks out uh, stands on the podium, faces the orchestra or symphony, and operates to conduct them, all right? So the conductor comes, and what does the conductor add to the symphony? They don't play an instrument. They don't um, beat on a drum. What the conductor does is provide timing. And so, when the conductor is doing their job properly, that creates a coherent organization of the various instruments and generates music instead of noise. When this pacemaker, which is essentially the conductor of the circadian system, is linked to the light-dark cycle properly, your body is a symphony disrupt this process and your body becomes noise. All right, so here's an example of a 24 hour rhythm. This is one in cortisol. Um, and so you can see um, with this particular diagram, it's a little harder to see the hourly pulses, although um, you can get a hint of them because of the scale. But this is a daily rhythm in cortisol, and the range is between 5 and 300 nan 390 nanograms per milliliter. 
And so what this means is that cortisol, which is an anti-inflammatory, it influences the immune system, it alters serum glucose levels, it um, alters sensory perception to some extent in the brain. What this tells you is that the situation with the immune system, the situation with inflammation, the situation with serum glucose, with sensory perception is going to change across 24 hours. It's not going to be the same at eight in the morning and two in the afternoon. So here we have a, a couple of other graphs. You have pineal melatonin, and that's dim light melatonin onset. That's what that stands for. You see core body temperature. You see another image of cortisol at a different scale. And one of the interesting things uh, about these is that I imagine if I ask anyone, what is human body temperature? The automatic response, depending on whether you're um, from the United States or from Europe, would either be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. And that would be your response. And if you responded that way, you would be right twice a day. Because in fact, body temperature has a prominent circadian rhythm. It changes at different times in the day. So body temperature taken at different times should be in fact different. And this means that you should interpret the data you get when you take body temperature differently, depending on when you have collected that information. So I wanna show you another thing. This, this relates to various um, elements related to respiration. So for example, this is peak expiratory uh, flow. Here you again have plasma cortisol, uh, but you also have plasma histamine and plasma epinephrine, all right? So there's the peak expiratory flow. Here you have plasma epinephrine and here you have plasma histamine. And you'll notice that the flow goes way down at 4 a.m. The plasma epinephrine goes down at 4 a.m., but plasma histamine goes way up at 4 a.m. So if you're thinking about this from the point of view of a respiratory therapist and you have a patient with asthma, when do you think that patient is most likely to have a, an asthma episode or trouble breathing? Well, given that his high levels of histamine tend to cause uh, bronchial constriction, that uh, low levels of epinephrine um, allow that effect, and that you have low expiratory flow, you would expect that the, the asthmatic would have uh, their most difficult time at what this would indicate four in the morning. So when do they? At four in the morning. And you can put the other graphs on top of this. So there's the epinephrine rhythm scaled for this drawing and the histamine rhythm scaled for this drawing. And you can see right away that it makes sense that breathing difficulties in asthmatics would peak at four in the morning. What that means is that whatever treatment you'd be giving such a patient should also peak at four in the morning because that would be the most effective time uh, to treat the patient. All right, does anybody have any questions about this? No, it makes perfect sense. It's so logical. Well, it turns out heart attack data also shows a very prominent rhythm uh, peaking at somewhere between nine and 10 in the morning. Now, what does that mean? It means that your interpretation of symptoms and risk should vary by time of day. The, the most likely time to uh, have an individual suffer from a heart attack is early in the morning, nine to 10 in the morning, well, like, depending on your normal schedule, of course.
Stroke also shows an incredibly prominent rhythm peaking at about three in the morning. So this allows physicians and healthcare providers to anticipate the times of maximum rest and generate the appropriate resources and the appropriate treatments based on maximum risk. And if you don't understand that there's this pattern uh, and you provide the same level of uh, treatment or the same response at different times of day, sometimes you may be uh, over responding and other times you may be under responding. Now, some of the therapeutic implications. If you look at, and this is the, this oscillation is simply daily oscillation, but there are daily rhythms in the nervous system, the immune system, the respiratory system, cardiovascular, endocrine, um, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal. There are rhythms in drug metabolism and transport, circulating proteins, renal clearance, intest intestinal excretion. So all the elements of pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics have 24-hour variation. In addition, many of them have shorter hour to two hour variations, and many of them have seasonal variations, and at least some of them have variations based uh, on the menstrual cycle, all of which will influence how a treatment will actually function. So there's data from a recent review, 2019, uh, not as recent as it was the last time I gave this talk, uh, but it is a summary of some of the effects of uh, circadian rhythm disturbance on cognition, cardiovascular system, uh, mental health, and neurological health. And so um, you can see with circadian rhythm disturbances, there's an increase in cardiovascular injury as levels of sleep deprivation go up, mental health uh, deteriorates with increased sleep deprivation. Neurological health uh, decreases with increased uh, sleep deprivation. And here, shift work, which is common in healthcare workers, leads to individuals who are more prone to making errors. And so the quality of care will decrease, putting patients at risk because of circadian disruption and sleep deprivation. So let me give you some results from uh, circadian disruption. And this is from shift work. Now, these are, of course, observational studies. There are two levels of fact, physiological and behavioral. Physiological effects, you know, abnormal and disrupted sleep, reproductive issues, gastrointestinal difficulties, metabolic abnormalities. All of these have been observed to be significantly greater in shift workers than individuals who are not on night or rotating shift. Increased cardiovascular risk, increased risk for certain cancers, including breast, prostate, and skin. For behavioral effects, increase, decreased performance and productivity, depressed mood, and increased neuropsychological issues, and increased suicide risk. Now, these are observational studies, and I'm sure you know that observational studies cannot establish causality. However, animal studies have investigated the gastrointestinal, metabolic, cardiovascular, and cancer risk, and in every single case, animal studies have confirmed the observational studies that circadian disruption increases the risk for cardiovascular disease, generates metabolic abnormalities, increases risk for gastrointestinal issues, and increases the risks for cancers, and increases the speed of tumor growth. So it is not just observational studies from human shift workers, it's animal studies which confirm those observations. Circadian disruption damages your health. So what about sleep? You know, we talked about sleep deprivation there for a second. And this is from um, the CDC. 
And this is uh, the last time that I've been able to detect that they recorded this data was 2014. And what they're showing you by uh, congressional district in the US is the percentage of individuals who are sleeping less than seven hours. If you sleep less than seven hours, you are technically partially sleep deprived. Um, it's interesting, I ran a study some years ago with Drexel students in biomedical engineering, and we discovered that these uh, undergraduate students were losing on average one hour of sleep a day, seven days a week for the entire 10 week term. By the time they had reached the finals, they were down 70 hours of sleep on average. So this kind of sleep deprivation is not unusual. And when you start looking at some of the results from this, there 50 to 70 million Americans have a sleep disorder, a diagnosed sleep disorder. 78% of those surveyed report snoring. Almost 38% report falling asleep during the day at least once in the previous month. And 5% report falling asleep while driving. 5% of all the respondents fell asleep at least once while driving, and they're still alive to fill out the survey. Some of the people who fell asleep while driving aren't around to fill out that survey. Drowsy driving has been linked to 1,550 fatalities and 40,000 40, non-fatal accidents per year. More people die because they're sleepy than die because somebody's drunk. There was a study a few years ago where they outfitted 100 vehicles with cameras to record what generated accidents. And use of a cell phone generated somewhere around 3 or 4% of the accidents. Fatigue was associated with 20% of the accidents. And it doesn't take much, by the way, to disrupt circadian rhythms. Just recently, we went and we changed our timing. I think we're now on Eastern Daylight Time, that one hour shift. Well, we know what that one hour shift is going to do. It's going to increase the number of traffic accidents. It increases the number of fatalities associated with truck accidents. It increases the number of medical errors. It increases the number of industrial accidents. And recently it was discovered that it can lead to as high as a 25% increase in cardiovascular accident in vulnerable populations, all because we change the time of the clock by an hour and lose an hour of sleep. The only difference, by the way, between the fall back and the spring ahead is the fall back is not associated with an increased risk of heart attack. But the fallback shows the same increases in accidents, errors, and fatalities associated with those errors. Now again, CDC data looking at uh, short sleep duration um, by survey again, uh, about 35% of all adults report um, insufficient sleep. That's what one would characterize less than seven hours as being. But if you look at the ages, there's a uh, variety of uh, sleep loss depending on the age. So this goes down to 18 and then goes up to um, greater than 65. What's real interesting is when you start looking at uh, youth, young people, and you look at Short sleep duration, look at these values. It's not in the 30s anymore, it's almost 70%. We go down to 12th graders and over three quarters of the high school students in 12th grades who responded to the survey, three quarters of them are sleep deprived. That's a stunning statistic. And you think of the risks that happen with adolescence. This is a time uh, of 
uh, emotional instability. Um, it is a time of great stress to add sleep deprivation onto that stress is guaranteed to make it worse. All right. So there is a, a number of uh, risks that seem to be associated with this short sleep duration, again, reported by CDC, um, including um, obesity. And if you have other comorbidities, it tends to exacerbate the effect of short sleep. A lot of things can keep you from sleeping. Uh, this is from a news article. Having light or noise at night, a hot room, mentation, um, use of computer devices, having a heavy meal right before you go to sleep, caffeine, of course, all of these things can inhibit sleep. But it's interesting, the devices, just how powerful that effect can be. So this is a problem. That is, you have a device. It is sending out fairly intense light. It will suppress melatonin. It will alter your circadian system. So here's a study looking at the effect of an LED screen and a non-LED screen. What I find interesting is this part here, where subjective sleepiness, you work with the LED screen, and that light suppresses your desire to go to sleep significantly. And so if you say, wake up at two o'clock in the morning, turn on your device, work on it for 20 minutes, that will reduce melatonin, but it will also significantly inhibit your ability to go back to sleep. The bottom line is actually that you can give yourself a sleep disorder. All right, so evolution of a health problem. In 2012, the American Medical Association described artificial lighting as a public health problem. You can begin to see why when you start looking at a map of the United States at night, you look at the late 50s, the mid 70s, 1997, and the projection for 20. 25, not a lot of dark there. And we already know that light inhibits sleep. It in, suppresses melatonin, it inhibits sleep. So if you look at Philadelphia, all right, here's a um, satellite view, uh, closer to surface view, and then Philadelphia after dark, this is after dark. What dark? With this kind of artificial lighting, how do you get dark? And yet, to properly synchronize your circadian clock, you need a light-dark cycle. If you don't get that light-dark cycle, or you get lighting at some sort of uh, non-predictable timing, then the circadian clock will not synchronize. Turns out Philadelphia is worked, ranked as the worst city in the United States for sleep health. And part of the reason you just saw. So in summary, before we get to questions, and I think I gave us enough time for questions. Yes, I did for once. Um, Living systems are organized around rhythms and cycles with varying frequencies, functions, and patterns. Interventions are possible at a multiplicity of levels and approaches. So there's the possibility of neural pacemakers to treat nervous system conditions or gamma oscillation to possibly treat Alzheimer's. Timing devices such as metronomes can treat behavioral conditions like ADHD or music therapy for both Parkinson's and dementia. Chronotherapy, targeted treatments based on biological timing are possible as long as you know what that timing is. 
We know that chrono disruption will cause or exacerbate health issues and that you, we should tr strive for temporal health by maintaining schedules and generating adequate sleep and use appropriate circadian lighting, meal timing, and activities. All right, so questions? Yeah, this is something that's definitely been going on in the physiology world, like even realizing how this really helps healing and um, understanding the like wound and muscle healing, the circadian rhythm, and just when you implement a um, treatment, how much it affects it and something that's really coming out that, you know, it's really interesting. So Don, thank you so much for presenting on all of this. So, okay. Don, I can hear you talk about wound healing. Uh, do you have some um, tidbits on that? Well, I don't have anything on wound healing per se, although I have a, a hypothesis about how the ultrasound helps stimulate wound healing through certain, this is my hypothesis, not, not that of, of the people doing the work, that it might have something to do with resonance and entrainment of metabolic activity within the, the cells associated with repairing the wound, especially the epithelial cells. But I haven't had a chance to really test that. Mm -hmm. um, since there's a circadian rhythm, at least in all cell cycles, eukaryotic cell cycles are about 24 hours long. And so your body has a number of cell division rhythms that it uh, incorporates. And if you take advantage of those, you can speed healing. Now, I, found, I, I was really amazed myself by this particular video. So let me see if I can get this to work. I'm across. Um, it's actually been out for quite a while that I didn't know about it. So I wanted to you know, let other therapists know I've had great results with this guy. Um, we're gonna demonstrate walking with no music first, just to kind of show the gait pattern. He's got Parkinson's. And so usually, you know, he's got the typical kind of shuffling gait pattern and difficulty with um, smooth gait cadence. Then I'll show a video with the music and you'll see the difference. training with music. Everybody's got cell phones. Everybody nowadays has music on their phone. So this is kind of a real easy way to do it. Let's stand here for a minute. We'll get the rhythm. Once we feel it, then we'll take off. Three. 
anymore. Bring me a lot to me. I guess we're all gonna be like we're gonna be. So what do you do with good old boys like me? Okay. Wow. That's why we study rhythms. Yeah. Yeah. If you had to make a playlist of your life. Hold on. There we go. So that that is why I try and promote the study of rhythms. It impacts everything and it allows for interventions that you couldn't possibly imagine otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're looking at two conditions that are profoundly debilitating. And there are two different approaches, both of which are using rhythms to intervene, and in both cases, non invasively. Yeah. Now, Music is certainly not a cure, and there's a lot of work to do with the gamma oscillations, but the 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 impetus is there. And the other video was of an interactive metronome where they were able to focus a child's activities who had ADHD by having them listen to a metronome and tap in time. I mean, you, I imagine we all have had the situation where you're in a class and you begin to, to tap your fingers or you begin to rock back and forth or you begin to swing your leg a little bit. That's part of this, this rhythmic process of integrating behavior and physiology. So, I would welcome any of you, if you would like to join my class in the summer, um, where I have a much, I have a little more time to explain all of this. But um, this is why I study this, and this is why I try and get other people to recognize its importance. Yeah, and the implications for the healthcare environment, you know, the hospital setting, in, in considering these aspects, I think, to be really uh, impactful, as, as you described before, you know, if, if systems were designed better. Well, and also, uh, if you think about the impact of shift work on the healthcare professional, one has to ask, is that the best way um, to treat people who are trying to help others? <laughs> there might, there should be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. I, I look, I still remember, and this was years ago, so I don't know if it's still the case. In New York City, after residents came off of their, their shifts, um, they weren't allowed to drive home. They had to get a cab because they were so impaired that the hospital would not allow them to drive home. And yet 45 seconds pre prior to that, they were making life uh, decisions in an ER. And, and there's a lot of disconnect in all of this. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any questions? Hopefully I didn't uh, get too, too enthusiastic here, but. That was fantastic. Thank you for the, uh, uh, the great slides and the visuals and the, that uh, video with the um, uh, Parkinson's patient um, was really Start. Remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. And I've seen remarkable. other videos of the same type. Um, the thought is that the appropriate music 
and trains certain elements of the motor system that are not being able to be controlled due to the disorder. There's a, the, you know, I, I, I showed the, the gamma oscillations with Alzheimer's, but music therapy is also used in dementia, dementia patients. And I've seen some real remarkable results there as well, where you will have an individual who, and I don't know quite how to describe it. They're, they're physically there, but, but not responding. And they will play music for a minute or two, and suddenly the individual will light up. They will begin to respond to, to questions. They'll begin to remember things from their youth related to music, but they remember. And you, you have to wonder how much of the individual is there that we aren't reaching and whether or not music can help us do that, that reach out. That's terrific. Yeah, there, I think there's a lot of um, uh, opportunity, potential for, for further research in this area. It's, it's promising for sure. Yeah, well, I, I certainly will probably go out and get myself a nice uh, 40 hertz light to, to stare at for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Where can you buy one? I was going to ask you. That was my question. I was just being gr uh, gracious to everybody. Well, else. I got to contact the, uh, the folks up at MIT and see what the status is at this point. Because okay, yeah. that's one of those things where I might just, you know, yeah, I, I, I could rig up a 40 hertz light. It wouldn't take that much. Yeah. Well, we could, we could be, uh, you know, uh, resellers, you know, tell them if he wants to have a deal, we could, we could be entrepreneurial. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan to me. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McKetchen. Uh, that was really uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening.